Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate, a First Chapter Friday video with The Word Nerd. Today, as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Stay all the way to the end to see if you've written it down correctly. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be reading to you from Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate. Now, most of the books on my channel are totally appropriate for all middle schoolers, but this one the publisher lists as ages 14 and up. So my fifth, sixth, and seventh graders, I need you to press pause, go back to the playlist, find a different one. If you're in eighth grade and older, let's carry on. Now, I first heard about this book from a presentation done by the CCBC. That's the Cooperative Children's Book Center. It is out of Madison, Wisconsin, run by the Department of Education of the University of Wisconsin, um, and they are an amazing resource. I will link them below. Teachers, you are definitely going to want to check that out. But as the presenter was talking about this book, I knew that I needed it immediately. So I ran to my local Barnes & Noble, I picked out a copy, John, it was the last one, you're gonna wanna order some more, um, and devoured it. It is an intense story of both internal and external conflict. Um, and I know that once you pick it up, you are going to love it. Um, but it got me thinking, you know, I heard about this book from the CCBC, and sometimes I find out about books by scrolling through Instagram or by browsing at a bookstore or because a friend tells me that I absolutely have to read a book. Um, so I'm curious, I'm gonna leave the comments open on this video. Where do you find out about the books that you are going to read? Um, do you have some favorite websites or blogs or resources um, or that uh, book nerd friend that is always telling you what you read, need to read next? I'm, I'm curious how you find your stories. Um, um, maybe you have some suggestions for me, um, so please put those in the comments below. There's one other thing that we need to do before I read you the blurb and the first chapter of Alone Out Here, and that is that I need to just celebrate for a little bit because, and I'm hoping you'll celebrate with me, because this video marks the 100th first chapter Friday video I have recorded for y'all on this channel. and. That feels really exciting. 100 amazing stories by incredible storytellers and writers. Um, and when I started this channel, that was my goal, was to help you find great books, uh, to not just rely on, um, you know, the ones that are available on the shelf or the ones that uh, have been taught forever. Um, to share with you all of the goodness, because we are living in a golden age of kidlets and um, I'm very passionate about getting those books into your hands, and um, hooray, we have done it. 100 videos, 100 stories, and I am so excited. So yay, thank you for being here with me. Um, if this is one of the first videos that you have found me for, I know that there are a whole bunch more. There's an entire playlist uh, waiting for you. So yay, cheers. Done with that. Moving on to today's story. Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate. This is what the blurb says. The year is 2072, so not that far in our future. Soon a volcanic eruption will trigger catastrophic devastation and the only way out is up. While the world's leaders, scientists, and engineers oversee the frantic production of a space fleet meant to save humankind, their children are brought in for a weekend of touring the Lazarus a high-tech prototype spaceship. But when the apocalypse arrives months ahead of schedule, first daughter Li Chen and a handful of teens from the tour are the only ones to escape from the planet. This is the new world, a starship loaded with a catalog of human artifacts, a frozen menagerie of animal DNA, and 53 terrified survivors. From the panic arises a coalition of leaders, spearheaded by the pilot's enigmatic daughter, Ellie, who takes the wheel on their hunt for a habitable planet. But as isolation presses in, their uneasy peace begins to fracture. The struggle for control will mean the difference between survival and oblivion, and Lee must decide whether to stand on the side of the mission or her own humanity. With aching poignancy and tense, heart-in-your-mouth action, this enthralling saga will stay with readers long after the final page. But before we worry about the final page, let's worry about the first page. Chapter one, Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate. Actually, this is a little bit of a prologue. 
Remember, the prologue is the little part that comes before the story that the author feels is important enough for you to know before you begin. I remember one night more clearly than the rest. It was the hottest July on record, and I was 15, lying awake and sweaty on the faded linen sofa in Lily's basement. With the way the crickets were squalling, Lily couldn't get to sleep, which meant no chance of sleep for Marcus or me either. So the three of us were talking ourselves into the universe, fantasizing in scratchy voices about God and death and the first day of sophomore year. And around 2 a.m. we wound up whispering about the end of the world. We kicked the questions around before. Maybe you did too. If the apocalypse hit tomorrow, which five people would you pick for your zombie survival team? Which three things would you take down to the nuclear bunker? What would you save from the wasteland? <clears throat> We never settled on answers. Lily drifted off halfway through, and the next morning Marcus kept swapping his choices back and forth, clarifying the rules over breakfast. Is there internet in this wasteland, he'd asked, thumbing his glasses up. If I brought my headset, could I have unlimited games? Lily rolled her eyes and said, God, Marcus, what kind of amateur apocalypse do you think this is? And I lay back in her window seat and laughed, loose-limbed and careless, because everything we were saying felt unreal. That was three years ago. Now most nights I lie awake and watch those moments replaying across the backs of my eyelids. I retrace the pikes of sunlight angled through the window or feel the frayed edges of the sofa, the patches that Lily's golden retriever pawed to death when he was too young to know better. I hear the way my friends sighed after they laughed deep and contented, like they'd just taken a cold drink on a hundred-degree hundred day. It hurts to remember, knowing that two months later the announcements froze the world like amber engulfing a living thing. But I can't make myself stop. I wish I could show it to you to really show you. I wish I could scan my old life out into VR space so you could walk all the way inside. We'd step through Lily's messy little kitchen like archaeologists through some perfectly preserved temple, and I'd pause the scene, point to the scar on Lily's chin, and tell you that happened when we were 13, the day she hacked a foot off her hair with a pair of garden shears on a dare from Marcus. He wasn't even being serious, and as for me, I stood there and watched with a stupid grin on my face, not believing it would happen until it did. And maybe you'd say Lily sounds reckless or impulsive, and Marcus and I should have known better, and I'd probably say, yeah. But that's Lily. That's Marcus. That's us. That's what I'd say. Part one is called Flight. And chapter one takes place on July 19th, 2072. I startle awake to a world that's alive. Everything is a tumult of sound and motion, a siren howling overhead, a glow pulsing through the bear's windows, a bear bulb over my bunk trembling like a furious fist. I sit bolt upright as the screaming starts. For an instant, I can only stare at the rows of bunk beds in chaos. I know exactly what's happening, I just don't understand how. The eruption isn't due until next spring. Soon is the shorthand that news anchors have been using, as in soon cubic miles of lava and ash will explode from Mount Shasta, a peak in Northern California, and cause a chain reaction that will render the planet uninhabitable. Since the announcements, we've watched the ground swell like an abscess and waited for the lands to drop, hoping and praying for more time. Now, I don't hope, and I don't pray, I'm rolling out of my bunk and cramming my feet into sneakers. If the last three years have taught me anything, it's that denial is useless. Only the facts matter, and there's just one fact to cling to now. The Lazarus. One of the generation spaceships that were meant to save millions of people is standing half a mile outside our barracks door. I seize my backpack from the floor, but the straps snug taut, caught beneath the bed frame. Move, I grunt, pulling harder. Come on, move. It isn't coming free. I need to open my hand and run, I know that, but protective panic is blazing up in me. The thought is that this is all I have. Someone lets loose a string of Arabic behind me and a pair of hands heave the bed frame upward. The bag flies free. As I hug it tight to my chest, I cast a wild look around, but the speaker has already disappeared into the mayhem. I wrangle the bag onto my shoulder and sprint for the exit, darting between the shadowy muscular bodies of soldiers. Warren and Jones, my Secret Service detail, passed me to these officers yesterday, six high-ranking military officials assigned to safeguard our group. 
Last night on the way to the cafeteria, I heard them muttering mutinously to each other about babysitting. Now they're barking commands over the siren, trying to corral stricken 11-year-olds into line. I join the cluster of people at the door, just as a girl flings it open. She cries out, clapping her hands over her ears. In pours the sound, the undertow of rolling bass, the gut-shaking drop of the earth tearing apart. Our cluster recoils, stunned by the roar and the sea of haze outside. Mount Shasta is a hundred miles away, but then that's nothing to this kind of explosion. 200 years ago, the Krakatoa eruption shattered eardrums 50 miles out. People 300 miles across the ocean heard sounds like gunfire. The last Yellowstone eruption dropped ash from Los Angeles to the Mississippi River. A high voice calls, Kimbini! A Kenyan president's daughter, Caro Omandi, darts through the crowd and over the threshold, small and nimble, her long brains cascading out of her black silk scarf. The spell is broken. The rest of us plunge after her into an oppressive heat as tangible as water. We hurtle across a concrete plain that glows dully under the stands of floodlights. Thick haze rolls through the light like cumulus clouds and rapid time lapse, shrouding most of the complex. The vehicle assembly building where the ship was constructed is a shadow in the distance, and the launch control complex, which looked yesterday like flecks of static fuzz breaking the horizon, is completely invisible. Only the Lazarus is clear, looming dead ahead. The ship is X-shaped and aerodynamically sharpened like the tip of a Phillips head screwdriver. Even half a mile away, the size of the thing is staggering. Booster rockets are bundled to its four wings at intervals tall and sleek and alabaster white, and the whole apparatus sits astride a postatronic impulse launcher. It's a hundred feet high. Most of that bulk will unbuckle during the liftoff and tumble down into the Pacific Ocean. As we run toward the launch pad, an unexpected calm closes around my head. Carol and the others diminish into splashes of color, just another field of contestants in another race. I imagine lines spray-painted on tufts of grass guiding me toward a clock, suspended at the finish line. As concrete scrapes beneath my sneakers, I feel the mile repeats I used to run in suffocating August heat, and the ache of an oncoming shin splint, and the cramps that dug like the forked tines beneath my ribs. All these painful tools that forged me into an instrument of survival. Then I'm leaving the group behind. I'm passing Caro. I'm speeding by a Thai girl who's pressing her glasses to her face. I'm overtaking a younger boy whose lips are quivering as if he's on the verge of terrified laughter. We used to laugh when she ran alongside me at the end of practice. She never had my endurance, but she could sprint like no one else. She'd cut halfway through the route and reappear at the end, challenging me, crowing as we flew toward the finish line. Is that the best you can do? I push harder until only one figure remains at my shoulder. Sergei Volkov, the sandy-haired Russian boy I recognize from our tour of the Lazarus. A head taller than me, he holds pace as we match kick for kick. Soon we're skidding to a stop at the base of an access tower. I pummel the elevator call button, my throat burning while Sergei stares back into the haze. The door opens and I dart inside, about to hit the button labeled ship access, but Sergei seizes me by the wrist and speaks urgently. The words are inaudible under the siren. What? I yell. He yells something back in Russian and points toward the dark figures growing out of the haze, then stretches out an arm to hold the doors open for them. I feel a shock of guilt and then do the same. We wait until two dozen kids have crammed themselves in, packing the elevator wall to wall. Then the mirrored doors glide shut, dulling the noise outside. <clears throat> Coughing follows. A flurry of hands brought to mouths. Everyone's eyes are rimmed pink and streaming from the haze, including Sergei's. But he nods to me, and I nod back, wiping my face clean, tying my hair up into its usual high ponytail. At last, I have a second to think, but none of my thoughts are reassuring. Our barracks are a temporary building constructed miles nearer to the ship than any other. The launch control center is nine miles away. Any closer, and their delicate instruments would have shattered under the thunder of the Lazarus's engine tests. The crew's living quarters are even farther out. How quickly can they cross that distance versus how quickly will tectonic aftershocks ripple down the fault line of the California coast? How soon will the fresh ash fall thicken like blizzards versus how soon can we seal the doors? In the long term, the ash cloud by itself would have been survivable. 
The death knell is what scientists found when they probed beneath Mount Shasta, possible quantities of methane that will blast out from the deep geological reserves, transforming our atmosphere forever. Three days from now, the outgassing will be complete. Within two weeks, Earth's cloud cover will have begun to expand, trapping in ever more water vapor and heat in a vicious cycle. And after a month, the air at half of Earth's latitudes will be unbreathable. Then, as the ice caps melt, the sea will climb to flood most major cities. In the coming decades, our oceans will boil away altogether until Earth resembles Venus. A dry-surfaced, 800-degree wasteland. Before 2069, hardly anybody knew the term for this process, <clears throat> runaway greenhouse. Now it's one of those phrases you hear so often that it feels almost meaningless. Images of fires and floods war in my mind as the elevator rises at an agonizing crawl. A girl jammed in at my side is speaking in Arabic. Her voice is small and terrified. Soon she's hyperventilating, repeating a phrase again and again until it's a cry. Finally, she punches the wall of the elevator so hard that the car shivers. Half a dozen others yell at her, their language is mixed in, into, in an unintelligible clot. Hey, hey. I touched the girl's back and she twists toward me. She looks maybe 13. Her dark eyes are enormous and she's breathing so hard that her lips are fluttering like paper. It's okay, I say, hoping she knows some English. We're nearly aboard. We just have to follow the launch process. I expect the girl to snap at me or maybe to burst into tears, but she hesitates instead, searching my face. I glance at my reflection in the elevator door and see what she does. I'm as straight-backed and composed as my mother delivering a speech. My fear is invisible. What process, the girl says, still shaky. Some of the other kids are watching, too, the ones who toured the launch control center yesterday instead of the Lazarus. Their group must not have gone over the procedure. I raise my voice. Passengers go up to the cabins and follow the instruction cards in the bedside tables. Just stay calm. The crew will be here soon. The words have hardly left my lips when the elevator door cranks open. We clatter out through the access arm, and at the end of the passageway, we have a stroke of luck. The hall door is already open. We, at the, uh, the hall door is already open. After crowding into the airlock, we find the secondary bay, bay doors open too. We step into the Lazarus. The ship is another universe, quiet, still, and dim. We've emerged in the atrium, the intersection of our, the four wings, the center of the ship's X. Overhead walkways curve like ribs through ten stories of space, joining one wing to another, limbed with traces of light. I wonder about the lights, why those recessed spots are always glowing like eyes in the jungle. Sudia, Sudia, Sergi calls, waving everyone up toward a ramp that spirals up toward the wall, leading to the ship's interior elevator bay. I'm about to follow when my gaze snags on a Korean boy's profile. In the half-light, shaggy black hair disheveled and glasses askew, he looks like Marcus. Right now, is the Cho family driving to the nearest bunker site, Marcus' sister watching the eruption on her phone while the fiery pictures flicker across Marcus's enhancement lenses? Is Lily flying around her bedroom, snatching up mementos while Mrs. Dionzino yells for her to hurry? If my mother were here, she would take one look at me and say, Lee, are you with us? It's a phrase she says brusquely, like a teacher checking in on a distracted student during class, but to me it's always been reassuring. I notice you're gone, she's saying. What can I do to bring you back? The thought of her wipes out every other thought, the way a dead bulb and a string of lights make the rest go dark. My parents are in Geneva for a summit of the Global Fleet Planning Commission, and there's nothing like a launch site anywhere in Europe. Besides the Lazarus, our prototype, every ship in the fleet is still half finished. And the other kids and I traveled out to California to learn how ships would operate next year, like a field trip. We were supposed to be tourists here, not permanent residents. I shove my hand into my backpack, groping around for my watch and earpiece. I have to call my parents, Lily and Marcus, too, before they're underground and out of range. I rip at zipper, stretch a lasket, but halfway through searching the front pocket, I lose my momentum because suddenly I remembered the watch's milky solar strip glinting, half covered by the pillow where I stashed it last night for safekeeping. A high-pitched noise builds in my throat. Safekeeping. I want to fling my bag across the atrium, but I can't move. 
Even if I were back there, even if I could call and they would answer, what would we say? What could we fit into this last shred of time? What could I possibly say that would be enough? Lee, I startle back into myself. Sergei is at the top of the ramp, Caro at his side. He makes a frantic motion toward the elevators. I'll wait for the rest, I yell back, pointing toward the bay doors. Sergei balks, alarm crinkling his forehead, but Caro tugs him back into the elevator with the others. I turn to the gap in the hall, staring down the pale artery of the access arm, and tighten my ponytail until pain radiates across my scalp. My momentary loss of control has passed, and it won't happen again. For eight years, I've had to be the counterpoint to whatever is collapsing around me. After the Washington Monu Monument bombing, bombings late in my mother's first term, when the whole country was screaming war, my parents trained me on a list of talking points so I could fend off any questions at school in a sober, level-headed way. After the eruption announcements, the whole world was terrified, so my parents and I had to look calm whenever we walked onto a stage. The first family means stability. Li Chen is an establishment, a first daughter before anything else. She is an illusion that matters immeasurably more than I do. A second group of kids rushes into the ship, dripping sweat and gasping. I direct them toward the elevator bay, but I don't follow. The crew must be close now, bundled into trucks and speeding toward us. Any moment they'll appear in the elevator. Any seconds, one moment, I'm on my feet. And the next, I'm flung into the air like a flicked insect. I crash on my hands and knees as a colossal boom thunders through the walls. I know what that sound is instinctively. Thousands of tons of molten rock punching out of the earth's crust. I scramble upright, my palms scraped and stinging. Faint screams issue from the residential wing, but the second group disappears towards the cabins on an upper balcony. I move to follow them, but a cool voice stops me. It arrives from everywhere radiating through the empty atrium and throughout the immense body of the ship. T minus five minutes to lift off. I stare up at the walkway in disbelief. Someone went to the ship's bridge and started the launch sequence with none of our personnel on board. Before I've made a conscious decision, I'm bolting up to the ramp toward the elevator bay. They have to stop this. When I know nothing else, I know we have to do what we are expected to do. The elevator deposit me, deposits me on the 10th floor. I sprint around the balconies and into the command wing. The floors are spongy black mesh bouncing me forward. T minus four minutes, the voice says. No, I gasp out. I race forward. The lights and walls begin to tremble and I don't know whether it's the earth moving beneath us or Lazarus's 40 Cirrus engines purring in preparation. I wheel around a bend and flinch back, burying my hands in my face. The hallway ends in an open door to the bridge where a brilliant glow pierces the windshield, banks of floodlights glaring into the ship. I lurch over the threshold, peering through my fingers. A dark-haired girl is standing at a dashboard so long that it wraps around in a boomerang curve. Beside her, someone in the commander's seat is navigating the launch gear with quick, fluid motions. The grid of buttons on the joysticks is cast in graduated relief like the skyline of a model city. Overhead, a low female voice says, Error, clear, launch pad. Error, finalize, internal measurement, unit alignment. Error, final leak checks, incomplete. The person in the seat flicks a switch and presses a palm down on the screen. Retracting, access arm, says the voice. What are you doing? My scream bursts out over the rumble of disturbed metal as the auxiliary power hums to life. Nobody is boarded yet. I clamber down the steps, hand outstretched to wrench the seated figure back, but then the chair revolves to face me, and I stop dead. The woman in the seat is as tall and broad-shouldered as an Amazon, a frizz of honey blonde hair floating around her face. This is the Lazarus's head pilot, Commander Sarah Jefferson. Now I recognize the dark-haired girl as her daughter, Ellie, who stood at the commander's shoulder yesterday like a lieutenant, eyeing our tour group with wary interest. They must have been here already when we came aboard. There why the doors were open, why the lights were on like a welcoming homes. Commander Jefferson scans me, sneakers to ponytail. If she recognizes me from the TV or the press, she makes no sign. She rounds back to the dashboard and says, we have people aboard, 54 of them. She points to a screen that shows live video of the hull door, which is now sealed shut. We've been counting. But the crew is still 
The crew knows we have to save who we can. The aftershocks are already starting. Every second on the ground is a risk we can't afford. Speechless, I watched the pilot's hands play over the controls. I thought the countdown was the work of some terrified kid throwing away hundreds of lives out of fear. This is different. A calculated risk assessment, a matter of protocol. But it feels just as brutal. Ellie, get her a suit. The commander aims a finger toward the bunk set into the wall. Then both of you, strap in. Ellie throws open a cabinet and tosses me a packet of white fabric. T minus two minutes, says a voice overhead as I tear the pressure suit out of the package. <clears throat> a hiss makes me glance over. Ellie has hit the vacuum seal on her suit, making its exoskeleton constrict her silhouette. As her visor slides into place, I meet my own eyes in the translucent mirror of its surface and see my face layered over hers. Suit up, Ellie says. She swings into a bunk and draws the straps into place, moving as efficiently as a dancer or a boxer. It all looks practiced, as if she knew, but of course she lives on this complex. For this girl, every waking second would have been colored by the fact that soon enough, it would be time to go. The commander's voice blares over the PA and rings down the halls behind us. Attention passengers! Pressure suits are stored beneath your bunks. Put them on over your clothes. Press the vacuum seal at your left shoulder and strap in as shown by the instruction card at your bedside. The orders translate themselves into Mandarin, then Spanish, as the commander springs from her seat toward the last bunk. Halfway there, she goes still. She's paled to the color of the moon. Her lips move fractionally as the PA repeats her words in Hindi, French, Arabic, Swahili. She breaks for the exit. By the time she reaches the stairs, she's in a full-out sprint. Mom? Ellie yells after her, but the commander has already reached the bridge's upper level. She's flying down the hall, a splash of golden hair disappearing. The voice overhead says, T minus one minute. I look down at my pressure suit, knowing it's time to strap in. I have my orders. But faces are flashing through my mind, the younger kids paralyzed with fear, clinging to their bunks, and the soldiers trying to urge them forward. The engineers and technicians and astronauts on their way, knowing that we're about to abandon them. I could force the ship to wait. After years of wishing I could do anything to help anyone, I could do this one thing. The pressure suit falls from my hands, and I go for the dashboard. Hey, Ellie says, stop. I hear her struggling against her harness, bucking against the straps like a restrained animal. The belts are locked. Get away from that, she yells. What are you doing? Truthfully, I have no idea. My fingers skim grids of buttons that clatter gently in their frames. There are hundreds upon hundreds acronyms printed on every surface. <coughs> and, heading that, and headings that reads pill separation has dozens of keys grouped beneath it. Divided into inscrutable combinations of letters and numbers, I scan them, hunting for the kill switch. As the voice says, 30, my eyes land on the screen where the commander was typing. The launcher sequence is playing through its final checks, vent valves locked, it reads, position shuttling fields active, orbital frame aligned, and there, in the corner, above a list of override codes, is a button, pulsing red. Abort launch? I lunge for the screen, but with my finger an inch away, I freeze. Commander Jefferson is the professional. She's right about the risks. What if I press the button? A tremor rocks the ship and the launch pad slips the skew and we die along with everyone outside. The red words blink, tantalizing me. What should I do? What do I think is right? I can't remember the last time it mattered what I thought. I feel utterly and terrifyingly free. T minus 10, says the voice. Nine, eight. The ship's engines roar to life. My mind becomes a circus of hysterical thought, a whirl of no, no, please wait, not yet, not now, give me more time. Not even all the time I want, not even measured in years, not even enough time to say goodbye, just enough to answer the questions knifing through me. Is it better to stay or go, to risk it all or run for your life? Is it better to live knowing what you've done or die knowing what you are? Seven, six, five, the voice says calm and sweet. Whoever recorded it was smiling, I think. 
The deep tissue roar in the air swells, and as the metal, ca metal casings over the windshield ease toward each other, I look up, shivers skating across my body. Fingers still suspended over the kill switch. Through the haze, a fiery light is shattering the horizon, and I think of a sun bursting out from our core. I think of a spirit erupting from a body at the moment of death. <clears throat> this can't be true, I think uselessly. It can't be real because only hours ago before I fell asleep, the moon was gazing through the barracks window. The real world is that stillness, that held breath of anticipation, not this. This panic, this mess of smoke, maybe this is just another nightmare in the same genre as the last three years of nightmares, and at the end of the countdown, my eyes will snap open and I'll breathe heavily for a minute before rolling out of bed wanting water. I look down to see a blank screen beneath my fingertip. Four, says the voice. Three, two, one. Pressure lands on the crown of my head like an anvil. This is not a dream. I topple into the commander's seat and it locks backward into a horizontal takeoff position. Spots explode in my vision as millions of pounds of machinery blast off. We move slowly at first and then accelerate mercilessly, gravity compounding on my skull, my throat, my wrists, pulling down at the soft tissue of my eyes. I begin to slip out of consciousness, choking, my body pinned and trembling like prey. And I feel ashamed, naive, for expecting myself to wake up. The old true world has evaporated the way old truths all do. People used to think the moon was fixed in a crystalline sphere. People used to believe Earth would last forever. The truth is always an unshakable thing until it's a story people used to tell each other. You guys are so good, and I can't wait for you to read the rest of Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate. If you want a copy, you can pick one up from your school library, although it's pretty new, so they might not have it yet. Just request it. Otherwise, you can go to a bookstore like Barnes & Noble or your favorite lo local indie, um, or you can always grab it via the links I have for you down in the description box. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the story and you come back again for more First Chapter Fridays. See you later. Happy reading. To continue reading Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your favorite local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the full First Chapter Friday playlist. As I mentioned before, I have over 100 videos of middle grade and young adult stories waiting for you to listen to. This week's mystery quote says, Presented with two terrible options, I somehow did something worse. I did nothing. Thanks for stopping by my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. Please like this video and subscribe. You can find more great content from me online at these places. Happy reading, and I'll see you again next time for another First Chapter Friday video.